Um, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to today's press conference here at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan in Tokyo. Um, I'm Anthony Rowley. I'm a former president of this club, and it's my pleasure to act as moderator today and to introduce our guest speaker, who's seated on my right-hand side here, of course, um, uh, who is currently a professor of economics in the Faculty of Policy Management at Tokyo's Keio University. Uh, welcome to the club, Shirai-san. Or I should say welcome back, because our guest has spoken at this club on many occasions in the past. Um, Professor Shirai um, was a member of the policy board of the Bank of Japan for five years from 2011 to 2016 and so she can claim the credentials not only of a prominent academic but also as a seasoned financial official and policy maker. And I think as such she, she understands what I'd call the arcane mysteries of central banking and monetary policy better than most people. And I think it's to her credit that Professor Shirai has sought to make these subjects more accessible to the likes of ordinary mortals such as myself. Uh, this is certainly true of her talk today, which is entitled um, Central Banking in the Coronavirus Era. Um, the subject just couldn't be more topical, obviously. Um, uh, central banks, along with governments, rushed to the rescue of the global economy and of the international financial system. Obviously, uh, she'll be putting special emphasis on Japan, but with a focus, too, on the international dimensions of central banking. I'll just say a few brief words about um, Professor Shirai's background. She graduated with a master's degree uh, in economics in 1989 from Keio University, where she currently teaches. And she also obtained a PhD in economics from Columbia University in New York in 1993. And among the many um, other distinguished posts she's occupied since have been those of an economist at the International Monetary Fund, the IMF in Washington, um, and a visiting scholar at the Asian Development Bank Institute here in, in Tokyo. She's also been an advisor on macroeconomic policy to the Minister of Finance in Zambia. So um, she recently published um, a book um, which is called, um, I don't know, I read it down in my account, I just, I just put it aside, isn't it? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, growing, central, growing Central Bank Challenges in the World and Japan it was published this month, and she will be making some reference to that in, in her talk. So let me hand over the floor to Professor Shirai, as we have rather limited time. Let me please ask you, any one of you who has um, mobile phones, to put them on mana mode or switch them off. Um, so, Professor Shirai, please. Uh, thank you so much uh, for a nice introduction. Um, um, due to the COVID-19 pandemics, um, I, I hear that a lot of people are participating in this uh, um, uh, today's event uh, through um, online um, um, system. So uh, what I like to do is, first of all, um, after, um, since this COVID-19 pan pandemics, um, I think this COVID-19 pandemics has transformed the global and monetary landscape dra uh, drastically uh, in two ways. So one is that sharp economic contra uh, um, contraction and the result resultant, the massive unconventional monetary easing uh, together with fiscal support. The second point is that because of these uh, infection problems, that there is a growing demand for contractless payment system and possible impact on demand for, ca uh, for cash. Um, actually, I published the book recently, and later I'd like to make an announcement. But today, uh, I'd like to focus on this um, monetary policy, and, and some um, uh, I will uh, touch on the fiscal policy as well. Okay, so the first point is today's uh, theme. Now, uh, let's uh, simplify and vi visualize uh, what's happened uh, since the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this is a very simple uh, supply curve and demand curve uh, representing the good and services market. So supply side, side is like uh, uh, producers and the corporate sectors. And as you see, usually there's a positive correlation between price and the uh, amount uh, produced. And, uh, and there is a demand curve, and there is a downward, uh, down, downward slope, uh, because uh, as the price goes down, consumer like us uh, increase demand. So since this COVID-19 crisis happened, uh, actually uh, 
the pandemics shifted the supply curve to the left and also demand curve to the left. That is, this is very interesting uh, because when you look at Lehman, uh, Lehman shock, it's basically uh, um, um, this created the sharp uh, decline in the demand. So there was a shift in demand curve to the left. But in the case of COVID-19, uh, because of this um, um, uh, supply chain disturbances, and so uh, production was stopped and then forced to stop. So it also affected supply, uh, supply curve. As a result, the implication on inflation is not as clear as, as we saw in the case of um, Lehman, uh, Lehman, um, Lehman shock. Because as you know, uh, not only demand was dropping, but also production dropped. So it's true that we see uh, some downward inflationary pressure, but it's unlikely to see a lengthening of uh, deflation. Okay, so that is a feature of COVID-19. Now, um, um, how this uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy affected this uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the first stage, which was led by a lockdown and state of emergency, uh, was on the left-hand side. So the purpose of fiscal policy and monetary policy was to prevent the supply curve uh, from shifting left, uh, left, uh, leftward and also to stop and to prevent the demand curve to shift leftward uh, further. And so, for example, uh, in the case of supply curve, the government provided the subsidy uh, to the companies, provided wage subsidy to the company to maintain employment, and, um, um, and also uh, um, um, debt guarantees and uh, subsidy interest, all try to uh, keep uh, production level and do not deteriorate the production level further from uh, to the left. And also demand curve, uh, you know, a lot of people got the cash, and also with the lower interest rate, we can borrow money from banks. So that also uh, stopped that demand curve from shifting uh, further to the left. Okay. Um, so I think the, in that sense, monetary policy and fiscal policy were successful in terms of uh, preventing the further deterioration of supply and demand condition. Now, uh, lockdown is over. Uh, state of emergency is removed uh, in many advanced economy. So now we are shifting to the right-hand side situation. So gradually we started to see an opening of shops and restaurants and factory. So supply curve gradually started to shift uh, toward right. In the meanwhile, also gradually we started to see a pickup in demand. So we see a, a moderate increase, moderate shift in the demand curve to the right. However, because demand is so weak due to the uh, social distance restriction and then people's anxiety and the bad, uh, very poor sentiment, it's very slow for the demands to recover. So now the purpose of monetary and fiscal policy is really uh, focusing on um, trying to shift this demand curve to the right as soon as possible. The, so as you can see, the purpose of the policy is changing. So this is a common uh, government support measures. Uh, most of the economies in the world, you see a very similar type of uh, uh, government support, like supporting the health system, uh, and giving support for the company with guarantee and subsidized interest, and uh, providing cash to the individual and the companies, tax deferral or reduction, very similar. And then it's very similar because of the reason I just explained, the, uh, because of this unique type of the COVID-19 pandemics. So what was the scale of the government's support? Now, it's, this is very uh, uh, tricky, because some country, you know, uh, uh, only look, uh, including budgetary amount, but some country like Japan is including some private funding, so it's not necessarily budgetary uh, you know, um, uh, outcome. So it's very difficult to compare. So what I did is that based on available in information, uh, I put all these numbers. Uh, the, since the COVID-19, the, um, uh, the measures taken by the government uh, to cope with this pandemic and crisis uh, as a percent of GDP. Now, Japan, uh, the, Mr. Abe mentioned that he had this two round of huge uh, government support, but uh, that included some uh, leftover amount uh, decided in December last year. 
and also including some private sector element. So I try to ex exclude that. So then the number will be around 28 or less uh, rather than 40. So this probably are more reasonable um, the numbers to compare. So what we can say is that in terms of the uh, amount uh, uh, the, uh, the of government support adopted by, uh, in the advanced economy is more or less comparable uh, in terms of size and scope of the measures taken. So now the fiscal policy's uh, focus is shifting uh, from the massive, uh, massive substantial uh, uh, support to the, uh, uh, to the whole uh, countries. And now uh, they are trying to increase the support moderately. And now uh, the focus should be targeted. The most uh, needed peoples we should provide support. So this is the uh, essence of the fiscal policy. So now let's look at the monetary uh, easing. When we look at uh, major uh, countries, uh, we see a very common features. Uh, for the central bank, which uh, do not face the, the zero interest rate pounds, so non-binding central banks, they uh, substantially cut the policy rate. And also, all central banks provide, provide massive liquidity to the commercial banks and financial institutions. And, and many countries initiated or expanded QE massive uh, financial asset purchases. Now, I uh, chose, chose a few uh, selected advanced economies. And let's look at the left-hand side. Uh, those are the policy rate, uh, you know, um, and uh, adopted by the central bank uh, as of today. And as you can see, uh, all these top five uh, countries are now facing more or less 0 percent. So they are now facing zero, uh, zero, uh, zero lower bound. Okay, so uh, as a result, all these central banks are doing unconventional monetary policies. And, uh, and what about negative interest rate? It's not popular. So only uh, uh, ECB and Japan continues to um, have a negative interest rate. Asset purchases or QE is very popular. All central bank adopted the massive uh, um, um, asset purchases, especially government bond. Yield income control. Uh, was used by the, uh, is, is being used by Bank of Japan to try to stabilize 10 year yield at 0% together with the uh, negative interest rate on the short term interest rate. Uh, only Australia uh, adopted a similar one, but not uh, um, 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 the case of Australia is that they tried to uh, introduce this YCC, but rather than stabilizing 10 year yield, they tried to uh, stabilize 3 year yield. Okay, I think because there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of, you can ask me later, there's a lot of problem related to this uh, stabilizing long-term yield. So I think uh, uh, an Australia wanted to buy, avoid, and try to um, control the, such a long-term interest rate, so they just try to stabilize three-year uh, interest rate. Um, stock ETF purchases, uh, no uh, other central bank adopted, and only Bank of Japan expanded the upper limits to the uh, 12 trillion yen annually. Now, let, when we look at all these central banks, uh, which central bank is doing very aggressive, uh, um, you know, influential uh, monetary policy? Uh, from my perspective, there is no question that Fed is most aggressive uh, and uh, innovative central bank uh, in, uh, in order to cope with the COVID-19. Why? Because this balance sheet is already growing uh, by 50% of GDP since March, since COVID-19. That is huge. And second, because they are purchasing foreign angel, so corporate bond, uh, which used to be uh, rated at uh, sort of a um, investment grade, so above triple B, and now fall to the uh, double B, and uh, Fed is purchasing the, those uh, foreign angels. Uh, that means central bank are taking great risk. And also, uh, Fed started this Main Street lending program, which means that, uh, that when the bank provides four-year loans to the SME, the Fed is purchasing 95% of those bank loans. That is a very significant and very unique approach. And this is the evidence that Fed is taking tremendous risk. The second uh, central bank is, I think, ECB. And the third is Bank of England. So if you are interested, you can ask me a question later. What about Bank of Japan? 
Remember, there was a monetary policy meeting uh, uh, in June uh, this month, and the Bank of Japan announced uh, that the one, one 10 trillion yen package. That is about 20% of GDP. So Bank of Japan was saying, so we are providing huge, uh, huge uh, um, uh, monetary easing, and probably the, you know Bank of Japan in their mind they are looking at the Fed, and the Fed is no question they are so aggressive. So maybe Bank of Japan wanted to show that in terms of volume, the Bank of Japan is also very aggressive. However, uh, what is important is that this 110 trillion yen is not a committed amount, okay? And because 80% out of this 110 trillion yen, which is about 90 trillion yen, is based on the expected amount on loans to the uh, banks from central bank. So it's just a central bank's expectation that uh, this amount can be possibly uh, extended to a commercial bank, but the co it's up to commercial bank. Right? So if the commercial bank, uh, uh, they have plenty of money, and they have a growing uh, deposit, and they have plenty of money, uh, so if they don't borrow from Bank of, bank of Japan, then obviously this amount will not be uh, fulfilled. And also, compared to the ECB, the ECB is also providing uh, lending to the commercial bank under Trutro, Trutro 3, uh, but they are providing quite big sub, uh, subsidies. For example, if I'm a bank at, uh, uh, and then I want to borrow from ECB, uh, the, uh, if I borrow, I can get money and at 1%. And so the subsidy is quite big. But the Bank of Japan provided some kind of a subsidy uh, in June, but very tiny. So uh, the subsidy given to the banks is not so big, and also it's not clear whether the bank really needs such kind of money. And the remaining 20% out of 110 trillion yen uh, is uh, um, estimate uh, of the Bank of Japan's purchases of bond and commercial papers. But unfortunately, in Japan, uh, corporate bond and the commercial paper market is very tiny. It's just a 10% of GDP. Because our economy, banks basically uh, um, um, depending on bank loans. So uh, corporate bond and commercial papers are only issued by very large uh, companies. We don't have a junk bond market, and it's just so, so tiny. So yesterday, Nikkei newspaper was saying, oh, so all of a sudden, uh, thanks to the Bank of Japan's uh, uh, bond purchases, so the companies are increasing the corporate bond uh, issuance, one trillion yen. But one trillion yen is really tiny when we talk about this, uh, the, the size of corporate bond. So I would say, of course, it's helping large company, but basically this is a large company's market, and the large company have a lot of cash uh, and then reserves, and they can easily borrow from banks. And uh, uh, this is nothing to do with uh, small, medium enterprises. It's a very similar, uh, different from United States. So when we look at uh, um, 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 other factors which are contributing to the recent increase in the Bank of Japan's balance sheet, it's mainly uh, um, the major factors is US dollar lending. About 24 trillion yen uh, um, increase we could see. Uh, um, this is because the Bank of Japan is borrowing the US dollar from Fed. So, of course, Bank of Japan is including this US dollar uh, financing to the commercial bank in their uh, toolkit, but this is basically a Fed monetary policy. It's not Bank of Japan's monetary policy. So, once you exclude that, the scale of Bank of Japan's uh, balance sheet increase is very limited. Um, and then, until uh, COVID-19 happened, Bank of Japan was struggling to purchase the government bond because Bank of Japan is already having one half of government bond and already created scarce situation in the Japanese government bond. So Bank, was not, uh, Bank of Japan was not able to buy uh, JGB. Now, from April, because the government started to issue bond, so um, and the Bank of Japan is able to increase JGB. So it's really Bank of Japan's this purchases of JGP is in the action to the growing uh, fiscal and deficit financing. 
Okay, so I would say to conclude about the Bank of Japan's policy, uh, the magnitude of the monetary easing announced by the Bank of Japan is huge, but it's not a committed amount. It's very likely that this amount cannot be met. And uh, this really show the Bank of Japan almost ran out of the tools available, and already long-term interest is so low. So the impact, uh, additional impact uh, coming from this monetary easing will be uh, limited compared to the uh, other countries. Now, uh, after COVID-19, uh, what you can see is there is a clear relationship between this QE, which is government bond purchases, and debt financing. As you saw uh, in the previous chart, uh, all uh, government in the world is increasing the fiscal uh, deficit uh, I mean, and uh, um, expenditures. And so they are actually issuing lots of government bonds. And of course, the central bank do not say this is uh, uh, financing the uh, government debt. But the fact is that under NATO QE, uh, they are directly, uh, they are increasing the uh, government bond purchases. It's directly related with the growing government uh, financing need. Now, I think uh, um, this is inevitable. Because when we have a COVID-19, the private demand is so weak, so the government really have to come in and then have to support and give a lot of you know, uh, injection money to the economy, as you saw that chart I showed you, in order to stop the supply curve and shift uh, the demand curve to, uh, from shifting uh, to the left further. The government uh, intervention is necessary, so at this moment, cross-correlation between government and uh, monetary policy is inevitable. So I don't want to de uh, uh, criticize that. So that is necessary things, okay? And, but then, uh, then one thing I want to note, uh, mention to you is that, very interestingly, the Bank of England directly supporting uh, short-term debt financing uh, of the uh, UK government. So uh, they actually accept it in terms of short-term um, uh, financing. They are doing debt uh, monetization. And also, Bank of England is at this moment purchasing massive government bond. Fed, uh, they try to reduce the balance sheet uh, since the October 2017, but they gave it up in the July 2019. And since then, um, especially after COVID-19, Fed is the massively increasing balance sheet. So now uh, the size of Fed balance sheet is over 7 trillion, you know, 7 trillion US dollars. That is a 70% rise relative to the maximum achieved in 2014, 4.3 uh, trillion US dollars. And 70% of uh, Fed purchases is treasury securities. 30% is a mortgage-backed security. So you see, it's directly related to the uh, gov uh, government bond and financing. Uh, Bank of Japan and ECB continue to purchase government bond, and, uh, and then they uh, increase the pace of purchasing since COVID-19. Okay. So what what will be the implication on this relationship between QE and, uh, and this uh, government debt? Now, in the case of Japan, as you see, there's a very limited inflationary pressures. There are almost no inflationary pressures over seven years under massive monetary easing. I don't see uh, any factors contributing to the uh, uh, high inflation in the future. So Bank of Japan continues to face the limited inflationary pressure. And then Bank of Japan already hold one half of Japanese government bond. So uh, it means that it's very difficult for BOJ to cut the size of balance sheet. So, it's, um, so it means the Bank of, in of Japan's intervention is becoming a new normal. What about Euro area? Now, Euro area at this moment, uh, they are, uh, the ECB is purchasing lots of lots of uh, uh, government bonds in a peripheral country like Italy and Greece. So in fear of yield, yield hike in the peripheral countries and limited inflationary pressure like Japan, ECB also may find it difficult to reduce balance sheet. So it means that ECB's intervention may become a new normal again, I mean, like Japan. But what about US? Now, US, of course, now is uh, expanding the balance sheet uh, significantly, 7 trillion US dollars. But uh, one uh, difference between US and other uh, major countries is because uh, US government bond is an essential 
uh, reserve asset for global central bank and uh, global uh, investors. So it's possible that Fed uh, is going to reduce the size of balance sheet. Uh, it's relatively easier compared to uh, Europe and Japan. However, what, when you look at what's happened since December 2018, US stock market uh, is really influencing Fed policy. So US stock market may always anticipate uh, massive Fed monetary easing whenever uh, stock market stresses, stresses happen. So stock branch may become a main factor to determine Fed intervention. So that is, uh, I think, the area we have to look at uh, the, in the case of the United States. Now, I'd like to point out, when we look at emerging economies, there are many emerging economies uh, uh, whose central bank also initiated QE. Now, uh, for some emerging economy, let's look at the top. There's a trade-off between high credit demand and current account de deterioration. This is the difference between advanced economy and emerging economies. Now, emerging economies, uh, as a result of this QE, their long-term interest rate is going down, so the bank's lending rate is going down. So credit demand is growing, so uh, you know uh, that will contribute to the higher economic growth. But at the same time, that will promote the greater import, so their current account deficit will deteriorate further. So in terms of emerging economy, there's a trade-off issue. In addition to that, uh, unlike the advanced economy, emerging economies essentially face the possible inflationary pressures, especially through exchange rate channel, because many emerging economies, uh, they depend on the uh, cross-border capital flow. And then so uh, their, their exchange rate is very volatile, and especially now, when the advanced economy withdraw money from emerging economies, uh, many emerging economies experience depreciation, so that would uh, influence their in inflation. So because of that, uh, very different from the bonds economy. Emerging economy may have a potential inflation pressure. Then in the future, that they might have a trade-off between inflation cont uh, uh, controlling inflation and also now they are increasing depend on the QE as a way to, uh, to have a stable uh, government financing tools. So there might be trade-off between controlling inflation and loss of stable government financing tools. Let me quickly uh, mention to you what's happening in a global uh, discussion. Negative interest rate, as you saw, is not very popular. So no other central bank adopting negative interest rate. But interesting case is Bank of England is examining the, uh, uh, the feasibility of negative interest rate. Why? Because they think by having negative interest rate, they can lower the short-term lending rate, so it, it can increase the bank lending. But, uh, and there's a, um, the negative side, so the bank's net interest rate goes down, and uh, if they have a big money market fund like US, there's a huge damage generated to the MMF, so there's a pros and cons. YCC, the Fed is at this moment examining and uh, not like uh, Japan, stabilizing on the 10 year, they want to focus on like an uh, uh, Australian case. They want to focus only on three and five years, uh, but they are seriously examining whether they should introduce YCC in the near future. Now, finally, let me quickly talk about Japan's case. Uh, I want to explain you Japan's economic growth patterns. Um, before uh, um, um, Lima shock, uh, that Japan experienced peak. This is a real GDP level, level. Okay. So the peak was 2018 uh, January and March. Now, from year 2000 to the this peak, the main driver of the Japan's economic growth was consumption, household consumption, followed by export. Now, since the uh, Lehman shock, there's a collapse in the real GDP, and there was a, a gradual. Uh, um, you know, recovery phase, and it took five years for the Japan to recover this peak level. Okay. Now, main driver during this period was consumption. What is most important is that since the Japan recovered this peak level, the main driver of the economic growth was purely the corporate investment. Consumption is very flat. And the corporate investment was a major driver for the economic growth uh, during Abenomics. Where did this come from? 
It's partly a manufacturing sector and uh, um, service sector. Uh, they, they, have, they have a replacement demand. And also, manufacturing sector needs to introduce uh, more high-tech, uh, labor-saving technology, environment-friendly technology. Uh, but also, I think Olympic story matters. Because uh, since the 2013 September, Tokyo was selected as a host city uh, of the 2020 Olympics. Since then, uh, we started to see uh, this uh, active um, um, real estate activities, uh, lots of uh, um, um, construction of hotel, you know, logging, um, restaurants, shopping center, city development uh, in a major city uh, nationwide. And uh, you know, so real estate construction sector were very good. So that also contributed to the corporate investment. So the question is that, whether we can maintain such kind of growth strategy in the future. Okay, uh, let me quickly uh, summarize. So between the year 2000 and 2007, the average economic growth was 1.4%. Uh, uh, between this uh, 2013, once they achieved this uh, uh, peak level, uh, from 2013 to the uh, recently, uh, the average economic growth was just 0 0.9. It's very clear, clear that Japan's potential economic growth is dropping. Okay? Having said that, so uh, this is a, a sort of a market expected the Japan's uh, ec um, economic recovery path. And uh, it looks like uh, um, in order to achieve the pre-consumption uh, hike uh, level. So um, July to September uh, last year, just before uh, consumption tax hike, uh, the left is, uh, I said, equal to the 100. So this is real GDP. Since then, the real GDP dropped, and then COVID-19 happened, so we have a huge uh, uh, plunge in the real GDP. But after that, uh, based on this uh, ESP forecast, very moderate uh, economic recovery will take place. And uh, it appears to me that it takes three years for the Japanese economy to recover this pre-consumption tax hike period level. The issue is after that, once they, uh, once they recover the pre-consumption tax hike period, what will be the uh, Japan's uh, uh, growth trajectory? Now, remember uh, under Abenomics, uh, over the seven year, economic growth was 0.9%. However, the, I think now uh, Japan's potential economic growth is even dropping further. Um, and because uh, uh, technology progress is very limited, and also because we have a labor shortage, and that will give a, a growth constraint, and probably a likely scenario is 0.5% growth. So the point is that it takes about like three years to recover the pre-consumption uh, pre -consumption tax hike period uh, level, but after that, uh, it takes, we will have a very moderate, very, very moderate, uh, very uh, slow eco economic uh, growth. Final remark. You know, the, so now government is doing, uh, you know, looking at the how to promote the Japan's uh, economic growth. Uh, what is lacking in the policy discussion is that the, the, uh, the Japan's policy discussion lacks the vision of green recovery and bold e-government initiatives. Um, we hardly hear about green recovery when the left of the world is everybody talking about how to promote the cutting CO2, clean and uh, sustainable economies. I never hear anything like that in a Japanese policy discussion. And we should not go back to the original economic structure. That's not what we should do. We have to achieve more sustainable, resilient economic structure, not the V-shaped recovery. Also, as you know, this uh, COVID-19 reveals that Japan's problem, we are lacking the uh, electric, uh, electronic government initiative. Government is saying something, but I don't hear bold initiative. Without that, how are we going to deal with the future economy with a serious labor shortage? Second point, finally, the BOJ needs to examine whether 2% inflation target is essential in transforming this economic structure to make it more resilient. Is it so important 
to have 2% inflation. Maybe the Bank of Japan should do uh, uh, more in terms of promoting green finance and green finance market. And Japan is so limited. And government have to do more uh, better energy policy. Also, corporate sector have to do much more uh, to uh, cut the emission. And green finance market is the most important, I think, compared to the stable <laughs> price stability with 2%. So in that aspect, Bank of Japan, remember, they said they purchase but maximum the ETF purchases is 12 trillion yen annually. But that means as long as Bank of Japan purchase stocks like that, they are silent uh, asset owner. And it's contradict with ESG, environment and social uh, government uh, investment, and we want to transform uh, Japan's policy and the government uh, um, operation. And as, if the BOJ is increasingly becoming the largest silent uh, owner, I think it contradicts with the goals to achieve sustainable and resilient, resilient economic structure. Finally, quickly, I want to make an announcement. I, I, I published a book from uh, Asian Development Bank. It's called Growing Central Bank Challenges in the World and Japan, Low Inflation, Monetary Policy, and Digital Currency. Uh, you can download this book. And uh, it's, com uh, it's a combination of monetary policy and also lots of issues about central bank digital currency and cash and crypto asset. So now I will stop my presentation, and I'd like to get your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was particularly uh, rather amused by your final comment that green investment is more important than a 2% inflation target. Um, OK, well, well, today we are online. So um, if you have any questions that you would like to send in uh, to this address, news, news at FCCJ dot or dot jp send them in by email and we'll do our best to get them in to our speaker um okay well we'll go into q a um i wonder if i could um, start by just quickly asking you a rather general question mm -hmm. but it draws on your international experience as you said we've seen massive liquidity support from central banks and as i understand it fiscal support so far is around um 10 trillion dollars globally but at the same time, the challenge is enormous. I mean, the, 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 the sorry, the um, IMF t this week published uh, yes. its updated um, global economic forecasts, and they, I can, they can only be called horrific. And the global economy is going to contract by 5% this year, uh, rather than 3%, which they previously thought. The United States will contract by 8%, Britain by 10%, and I think Japan by around 10%. So the thing is, uh, how far can um, fiscal policy and monetary policy continue to keep the economy going, as it were, against this, this dreadful background? I mean, some people argue that fiscal um, uh, uh, support, it doesn't, uh, the government debt doesn't matter too much, um, and um, central banks sometimes seem to have endless resources to continue supporting the system. But in s as simple terms as you can, can you sort of just say what the, where the limits are on this policy. Yes. Okay. So, um, um, so private sector demand is remain weak, although there's a pickup. So I think we anticipate the continuation of government support and monetary uh, easing uh, for a while. Uh, it doesn't mean that the government should continue to provide massive support as we saw in the case of March, April, May. Eventually, because we have to, the company and also government have to truly examine uh, you know, whether the demand we used to have uh, before COVID-19 uh, pandemics uh, is sustainable, right? For example, now uh, we get used to online business, online meeting, so we no longer uh, need to uh, uh, go foreign country or local uh, you know, region, so we can save uh, a lot of transportation fee and then time. Also, we can cut CO2. Probably uh, many companies will continue to do so. Then the demand we used to have in the area of like transportation may not be the same. If that is true, then I think government really have to think how much more, more money uh, they should provide uh, to the such kind of sector if the demand is shifting permanently and 
Not only demand is shifting, but maybe we must change the demand structure when we talk about green and uh, um, SDG and ESG in the future. So uh, for example, let's look at Europe. Uh, the Europe is very clear. Uh, they are providing, government is providing sub, uh, subsidy and support to the company under the condition that company cut CO2, right? Especially uh, emission uh, intensive companies. That is a way I think we have to uh, do. So we have to look at the, uh, the, we have to have a vision in the future and see where demand is growing. There might be new demand like uh, IT sectors and the green field, uh, renewable energy. And if that is so, maybe money should be allocated to the, those sectors rather than existing sectors. So government, also company, have to uh, find it out whether the previous business strategy are really sustainable. So in that sense, uh, in March and April and May, government and monetary uh, central bank provide massive support, but in, eventually they, they, they have to be targeted. Um, about uh, how much the debt can go up. Mm. There's a di difference between uh, advanced economy and emerging economy. Emerging economy, as I said earlier, because uh, they have a more uh, inflationary pressure, Partly because they are still growing and they need a, a lot of, they have a lot of young people, so there's a demand. And there's a, a essential demand there, like turkeys, there's a huge demand there. And uh, also, uh, they often face the depreciation, so they tend to have a imported a higher inflation. So emerging economy, uh, there is a risk uh, if they uh, uh, continue to increase the government debt. But the advanced economy is different. Uh, the inflationary risk is very limited especially in Japan and Europe, yeah? and also Asian. The demand is not so much. So inflation is not a significant concern. So, uh, and, and that the ECB, uh, there's a, uh, they prohibit the monetar uh, monetization. So uh, there is a limit to uh, what ECB can do in terms of QE. So ja Japan is different. It's a single central bank. There's a no limit in that sense, right? So now uh, Bank of Japan uh, hold one half of government bond. Technically, they can buy more, right? But they couldn't buy it before uh, COVID-19 because there are institutional investors like pension fund and the life insurers uh, who need the long-term government bond uh, uh, to match. Uh, to, uh, match asset liability maturity. So that's why Bank of Japan couldn't buy. Yeah? So um, technically, uh, you know, if the government uh, will in increase the uh, Japanese government bond, um, setting aside this uh, natural demand coming from institutional investors, uh, Bank of Japan can technically buy. And uh, at this moment, uh, uh, only foreigners finance only 10% of Japanese government bond. So um, for a while, the Bank of Japan can do uh, these things for a while. Larry Summers and many, uh, many uh, prominent uh, uh, people all saying in advanced economy, because uh, long-term interest is so low, partly thanks to the central bank's massive QE, and uh, partly uh, like uh, Bank of Japan's YCC, stabilizing 10-year yield at 0%, but partly because the advanced economy, uh, the, um, economic growth is dropping uh, because of aging. Mm -hmm. The natural uh, equilibrium interest rate is dropping. So uh, you know, it makes sense that interest rate remain low. Yeah? But for a while, um, it, um, and interest rate was uh, dec uh, declined further uh, due to the monetary easing. But in general, central bank's interest rate is going to be low. Now, in that sense, the, in the meanwhile, nominal GDP growth is higher than the uh, long-term um, equilibrium interest rate. So that can be sustainable for a while. This is a story only for the advanced economy. That's why Mr. Summers and many, uh, many uh, uh, academics all saying for time being for the advanced economy, they can continue to do current policy. So massive QE by central bank and uh, lots of government support um, by issuing bonds. Yeah? Hmm. But eventually, what happened in the future? Hmm. For example, let's look at Japan. So now Japanese debt is 240%, and then uh, there will be an additional 30%. So there will be 270% by end of this year, right? 
uh, because of this huge uh, debt financing. So for a while, no problem. Bank of Japan can easily finance it. Uh, there's a life insurers who love to buy JGB, so no problem. We can do it. But in the future, um, as we, uh, our economy is uh, uh, aged, so we use up all accumulated saving, and someday our current account, account balance turn to the deficit, then we will start to depend on foreign money. Mm. Now, government bond can be 100% uh, technically uh, financed by BOJ, but what about private sector? If the uh, private sector want to borrow money, then they no longer are uh, uh, able to uh, finance domestically, and then they, they have to depend on foreigners. And when foreigners look at the Japanese economy, oh, your country is just what you are doing is central banks, um, uh, perfect monetization. And uh, we don't think that kind of economy is uh, appropriate, so we charge you higher interest rate. Then the, we will have a trouble. So uh, I think there's a limit as to the, the scale of this public debt to GDP ratio, how far this debt can go up. But nobody knows this is a unprecedented, uh, you know, uncharted territory. Nobody knows what level is uh, of the ceiling. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Summers and all others and they never say that. They can say, for time being, we can do it. <laughs> but, but I think eventually uh, we will face the, this uh, limit. And in the case of Japan, that is related to current account transformation of current account surplus to the deficit and then growing dependence on foreign money. Right, thank you very much. Okay, do we have questions from the floor? Please, uh, do we go to the microphone, please introduce yourself if you would, thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Etienne Balmer. I'm a journalist of the French press agency. Um, I wanted sorry, to could you put the microphone a little bit closer to you? Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, I wanted to, it's because I'm too tall. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to continue about uh, what you were just saying. Um, some economists also say that uh, in the future, uh, because of the so much uh, high level of, of debt uh, amount in the, in the balance sheets of, of, of the BOG, um, would that be possible uh, for Japan to just cancel the debt uh, holdings in the of the BOG balance sheet? Because some economists said that you know it, there would be just um, just accountancy variation and mm -hmm. no consequence on the real economy. Mm -hmm. Got it. C can I get another question? Can I? I got another one actually. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and also, you know, the 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 Fed is uh, is giving loans, has a loan now mechanism to small and mid-sized yeah. company. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think they are, the Fed is giving it directly to the company, not through the financial institutions. And so I wonder if if uh, Bank of Japan right now, as you mentioned, also is depending from this. I mean, is giving to intermediaries like the financial institutions or the banks. Mm. To, to give Good. money, you know, mm. to give the loans to the, the, the mm -hmm. SMEs. But uh, is it possible, would it be possible for the BOG to, to go directly to the, to, to give directly the loans to the, 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 the companies? Got it. Got it. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, sorry, generally we prefer to take questions. Yeah, on, okay, on got it. Sorry. So the first question about cancelling, so Bank of Japan has a, uh, about one half of a um, government bond, and so uh, that is a uh, Bank of Japan's asset. And on, on the other hand, when we look at the government uh, uh, account, it's a liability side, so if we um, consolidate it, we can cancel it out. However, What's happened to the Bank of Japan's liability, the reserves? Commercial banks uh, uh, holding reserve with central bank, right? So if you cancel uh, Bank of Japan's government bond on asset side, still liability remain. I mean, can we force the commercial bank forget about this, about like 300, well, a huge uh, deposit you have? Impossible. So that story is, doesn't make sense. It, uh, so uh, even consolidating the Bank of Japan's liability remains. Second question, so I, I, I know I'm quite familiar with the Fed policy. What they're doing is three things. One is that uh, in terms of corporate bond, uh, including foreign angel, 
the Fed is purchasing a corporate bond. What is unique is that many central banks, including Bank of Japan in the world, usually central bank purchase uh, corporate bond through secondary market, so through market. So we usually do not buy directly uh, um, um, uh, from the issuers. That part, Fed is trying to do. So not only from the secondary market, for the first time, uh, uh, Fed is trying to purchase directly from issuers. I think they haven't begun yet. They revealed this idea in March, but I think there is a, some technical prob um, problem in process. So they are going to do it in the future, but I think they haven't announced it yet. I mean, implementation is not yet, okay? So in that sense, that is unique. But usually central bank, because uh, I think because of this uh, concept related to the direct financing, usually they buy from a market. <coughs> So Bank of Japan, um, and like ECB or uh, Bank of England, all purchasing uh, corporate bond from market, okay? Now, uh, uh, I think there's no problem, because uh, um, in the case of Japan, um, large company, they can issue, easily issue corporate bond. And the corporate bond market is so, so tiny, as I said, just 10% of GDP. Many investors want corporate bond. It's a huge demand. Yeah, and so um, I mean, if the, so, uh, so there is a no problem uh, related to the corporate bond market. There is no distress there. So I think uh, you know, in the case of uh, United States, different because they have junk bond, and then there was a lot of stress. So Fed, that's why wanted to intervene in order to uh, reduce the uh, credit spread. But the ca case of uh, Japan, there's no problem like that. So I don't think we need to, uh, the central bank needs to directly purchase from issuers. Sorry if I may, but my, my question was not about bonds. I'm not bonds. Oh, individual, okay. No, okay. Was, okay, got it. And it was for central banks, loans to okay. companies. Yes, no, actually, what Fed is doing is three things, setting aside corporate bond. One uh, is a paycheck, uh, paycheck PPP uh, lending program. That is, uh, so government uh, in the CARES Act, uh, and, and they are um, sort of supporting the commercial bank's loan to SME, uh, which keeps uh, employment and paying rents and so on. Um, the Fed use this uh, bank loan as collateral and then lend money to the commercial bank, number one. Number two, uh, there is a Main Street program, which I just said. Uh, so bank, again, bank uh, lend money to the SME and uh, Fed purchase it from uh, banks. That is second. And then uh, another one is, uh, yeah, that's it. So actually there are no direct purchases, from, uh, no direct uh, extension of uh, loans to the companies, no. Okay. Um, yes, please, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Shirai San, Regis Arnaud from uh, Figaro, we talked yesterday. I have two questions. Uh, when you talk about the BOJ intervention in the economy, for, if I'm correct, around 40% of Tokyo Stock Exchange now is owned by the BOJ, more or less. Uh, doesn't it make, we never talk about, I think you say, moral hazard in, in such a scheme. I mean, there is a huge intervention, and to me it seems like there is a kind of public publicization, or there is a kind of, um, power grabbing by public institution of a private institution, that is the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Okay, it seems like a Soviet-style uh, economy uh, in the end, if, uh, if a public body owns the whole private market. Is it something dangerous for the economy, in your opinion? And my second question is, you wrote in 2009 about uh, Tokyo as a financial center. Ah, yes. And uh, there is now a new move about that because of the Hong Kong crisis. Uh, after the, your, since you wrote your chapter, 11 years after, mm. what have been the progress? They seem quite low, frankly speaking. And what are the pros and cons of establishing a financial center in Tokyo, for example, yeah. to make capital work better in this mm -hmm. country? Thank you. Okay. Um, about the Japanese stocks, uh, so um, the Bank of Japan holding of uh, stocks through ETF is about 30 trillion yen. 
the total uh, size of uh, Japanese stock market, so market capitalization is about over uh, 500 trillion yen. So Bank of Japan's holding is less than 10%. So it's, uh, it's not 40%. However, I have to tell you the problem about this. Because in Japan, also this uh, market size looks big. Yeah, it's equivalent to about 100% of GDP. But many stocks, at least 20 to 30% of these stocks, are held uh, through mutual strategic shareholding. So, uh, you know, under the corporate governance, you know, uh, FSA try to uh, tell company to reduce the strategic shareholdings, and, but still uh, many companies do that. Uh, so uh, 20 to 30 percent is really uh, not floating. Yeah? Um, and uh, so when, you, uh, and also probably many other way company, you know, uh, they don't declare it as a strategic holding, but they Many Japanese companies where they have uh, some joint businesses with other company, they like to have an equity relationship. So anyway, there are lots of lots of uh, equity holding by companies. So getting rid of that, the floating share is limited. Now, Bank of Japan and GPIF are the two biggest shareholders. Yeah? The GPIF number one, I think number two is BlackRock. And, uh, and number two or three is uh, so three is Bank of Japan, but probably if the Bank of Japan is purchasing at the pace of uh, 12 trillion yen, then uh, very soon the Bank of Japan will be the largest um, uh, owner of stocks. So Bank of Japan and GPIF, two public related entity, hold the the, uh, the two biggest uh, shareholders. So uh, question is. Is that a floating? <laughs> um, GPIF, I think it's very difficult for GPIF to sell 30 trillion uh, yeah, equivalent stocks. I don't think they will do it. Now, GPIF is uh, slightly better than Bank of Japan because GPIF uh, is a uh, passive, uh, passive uh, investors, and they, uh, sign, they sign up PRI responsible investment principle. And so they are very much uh, interested in uh, ESG, SDG. So they don't uh, manage the fund by themselves. They delegate all those uh, managements to the asset managers. But they want to make sure that asset manager do a corporate engagement and try to focus on the ESG. So at least the GPIF, although probably they will not sell it in the future to so just keep it. Uh, but at least they are not really silent, silent uh, uh, shareholders. But the Bank of Japan, because central bank, uh, they never really made any announcement about their principle, about uh, uh, what they are going to do with this huge uh, stock, uh, uh, stock uh, holding. So that is a bit more of concern. That's why I was pointing out at the end of my presentation, as a, a silent asset owners, uh, if their share is growing, uh, what would be the contribution to the governance of uh, uh, Japanese uh, listed companies? So uh, that is a concern. So I think, uh, to be honest, I think uh, BOJ should stop uh, purchasing ETF um, um, now. Already they are very uh, huge holders. And uh, pro probably do uh, other issues because of the, the problem uh, related to this uh, destruction of just Japanese uh, companies. OK? Sorry, there was a second question, which was because of Hong Kong's problems, ah, yeah. does okay. Tokyo yes. stand yes. a better chance of... Yeah, so I also look at the financial centers. So Hong Kong was so unique because Hong Kong was so important as a gateway to the mainland China. And so because of this political problem and uh, this uh, security law, um, I'm very much concerned about what will happen. But so far at this moment, there are very limited impact. Uh, coming from this uh, political issue on Hong Kong's financial market. Uh, because at this moment, I think uh, uh, many investors uh, think that uh, um, the impact of such kind of political issue on the Hong Kong's uh, status as a financial center uh, would be limited. Why? Because uh, many, many um, state-owned uh, enterprises and uh, many large uh, uh, Chinese companies um, they uh, raise fund 
through, uh, uh, through Hong Kong. So many Chinese companies uh, depend a lot on uh, Hong Kong's financial center. So it doesn't make sense for China to also damage uh, the Hong Kong uh, the status economically. So, uh, and also, if we think that Hong Kong is losing uh, finan financial center's status, I mean, which center is going to take over? Japan, very unlikely, because over these 10 years, nothing changed. Because uh, 10 years ago, what happened is that Japan has huge money, but little place to use, and so there's a piling up, the lots of money, and so, and then they accumulated lots of foreign asset, right, through investment. But many assets uh, allocated to United States and uh, Europe basically advance economy security and stocks. Very little uh, investment uh, took place uh, to the Asia. A FDI, yes, they do, companies' production. But uh, portfolio uh, and, and, and uh, investment was limited. Over these 10 years, what's happened? Uh, the, this f pattern doesn't change. But of course, uh, because um, large mega banks, three mega banks in Japan, because it's so difficult to uh, raise um, profit in Japan, so now they are increasingly extend the uh, credits to the um, growing Asia, uh, so loans. But still, the preference toward Europe and the uh, uh, United States hasn't changed at all. So Japan really not playing a role as a circulating the cross-border money uh, from advanced economy to the uh, emerging economy. So Japan is not really playing a, a role as a regional uh, financial center, no. The only uh, financial center which is doing uh, the sort of circulation, uh, the role of circulating money is Singapore. But Singapore has a totally different feature and the country is so small, and we know that Singapore cannot take over whole operation and, uh, operating in Hong Kong. So the, to answer to your question, uh, nobody knows uh, about the future clearly, but uh, Hong Kong probably remains uh, as an important financial center, uh, in, and uh, also probably uh, some uh, operation may shift to the uh, Singapore, but not to the Tokyo. Uh, okay, actually we are very, really technically at the end of our session, but uh, there, there is one online question, if you don't mind, I'd like to put to you. It's from uh, Richard Solomon at Beacon Reports, and he says, what does Shirai San believe the medium to long-term impact of COVID-19 will be on the US dollar yen exchange rate? If you could just say something briefly about that. Okay, so you see over this COVID-19 uh, period, yen dollar rate is quite resilient moving around 107, yeah. And it's partly because uh, Japan is no longer having a trade surplus economies. We are importing a lot. And uh, also, uh, because of the very low interest rate in Japan, uh, many institutions invested in Japan want to invest in uh, advanced economies. And so, um, and so there is a, uh, that creates the uh, depreciation pressure of Japanese yen. In the meanwhile, Japan's uh, yen still play a role as a safe haven currency. So whenever there's a strong shock coming, we see uh, some slight uh, appreciation of yen. So there is a, uh, uh, these two um, counter forcing, uh, counter, you know, two, uh, yeah, counter yeah, countervailing uh, mm. forces. So mm. that's why you see uh, the resilience. But in the future, uh, it really depends on what, to, uh, how uh, competitive Japan will be. Uh, for time being, um, you know, whenever there is a uh, risk of us, uh, um, you know, attitude happen, we might see uh, some slight ap um, appreciation of yen. But in the end, 20 years, 30 years, we, we may have yen <laughs> depreciation anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our time, but um, I thought your points about governments needing to change the direction of investment is was fascinating. And, and also, uh, so I think that's another topic, sustainable investment. We'd love to have you back again sometime to talk on, on that subject. Um, in the meantime, thank you very much for coming. And uh, may I offer you, as is our practice, a one-year honorary membership to the <laughs> <laughs>